Okay, well, I gotta say, it's a little refreshing to have the opportunity to talk about something aside from lithium and aside from batteries. And of course, MP Materials is focused more on the magnets more than anything else, or I should say the rare earths and the magnets. So, you know, I'm sure many people in the audience are familiar with the MP story, but for those that aren't, maybe if you could just take us back, talk about the genesis of MP, how you came across the asset, where we are today, and then of course stage two and stage three and how you hope to sort of vertically integrate. Sure, thanks, Well, Happy, thank you to everyone, I'm happy to be here. And uh, you know, I'm really an accidental industrialist. I, you know, I was running a, a hedge fund a number of years ago. It's a great name for a book, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take, I should trademark that one, right? Um, uh, so you know, I was running a fund and, and there was a predecessor that was a public company that uh, built out the, mm -hmm the uh, mine and refinery at Mountain Pass in California. And uh, they went into bankruptcy. They had spent $2 billion, they went into bankruptcy. Yeah. Um, in, in my fund, we bought a bunch of the secured debt. Uh, we really had no idea that we would be you know, involved in this bankruptcy. We assumed that the people behind us would figure it out, um, assuming there were plenty of parties and asset, you know, lots of asset value there. And what happened was, as it filed, it went into free fall and not a single credible financial or strategic buyer showed up to buy it, um, which blew my mind. Uh, mm -hmm. And actually there was another creditor in the process that was trying to push it into reclamation. So I couldn't believe that this world-class national security asset was, we were literally hours. I mean, it was almost out of a movie, um, speaking of the book, where we were in, in bankruptcy court in Delaware and the, the largest creditor in the estate wanted to push it into reclamation, which would have meant you lose your permit, in the state of California, if you lose your permit, you know, good luck. Yeah, it's gone. <laughs> um, and, um, and, you know, that would have uh, been a, a big problem. Um, and anyway, we kicked in some money uh, just to keep the eight employees going in care maintenance. Um, I'll fast forward a couple years of bankruptcy battle, but we ended up buying it out of bankruptcy. Um, we had to assemble some other assets that were owned by other parties as part of that estate and then relaunched it. And so when we formed MP Materials, when I founded the company in 2017, we had a mine, it was like, you know, all of a sudden I owned a mine. We had no corporate infrastructure, no accounting infrastructure. Um, you know, it was like, congratulations, here's what you've won, a busted mine. Um, but we, you know, we, we always believed in the, in the long-term secular theme around electrification right. and the importance of the national security. And I'll fast forward to today, and you know, last year we did nearly 400 million of EBITDA, we're mm -hmm. a public company. Um, and you know, we were able to build this from eight people to nearly 600 now. And, um, wow. So I, I think by all means, certainly for, for me and my investors, it was a great success. And I'd like to think it was an important success and highlight for the country to see that we can do this. We can you know, reshore these supply chains sure. and, and um, you know, our big competitor is China. Mm -hmm. um, but we have managed to be a low cost producer to the world. Um, and if we're not the, we're one of the vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. So we're, we're able to, to do very well in a place where you know, conventional wisdom was that we couldn't. Um, right. Just to finish off the question, and I'll, I'll stop, uh, you asked about stages two and three, so just to, for those who don't fully understand the rare supply chain, um, and, and this is probably a similar, is a similar theme in lithium and some of the other commodities, but you get the material concentrated, mm -hmm. you refine it, and then you turn it into a magnet. Um, and, and so if you don't have any one of those three, you can have all of the material in the world if you don't, you're still sending it to China to make magnets right. if you don't. So, we, right now, we concentrate the material at Mountain Pass. We have to send that to China. That's where our downstream industry buys all of the magnets. Um, we uh, committed early last year to invest $700 million. That was, um, was a big announcement by the president um, uh, where we had a partnership with DOD. They mm -hmm. were also going to invest $30 million alongside us. We've invested more than half of that. Our, refi our refining physical uh, equipment, that's all done. We're now commissioning the refinery piece. And so we look to hit run rate production of refined rare earth material at Mountain Pass by the end of the year. And then simultaneously in parallel, um, we're building a magnetics factory in Fort Worth, Texas. Um, that building, if you go look on Twitter, you can see we broke ground on that and last April, that building is topped off and basically done and now it'll take us a while to do the insides. Fill it up. Our foundational customer for that is General Motors, mm -hmm. so we will be a key supplier of magnetics to the Ultium platform and you know, obviously GM is very forward thinking and in, in willing to take a chance on, on us, the you know, American producer. So we're obviously grateful uh, for that. And 
But what's great is we've, we've really we've built a successful public company. We're now you know, public for well over two years. Um, we've got a fortress balance sheet, and yeah. we're profitable, but you know, we have an enormous net cash position, which is a great place to be in this environment, and in particularly in Absolutely. this industry. <laughs> Absolutely. And so, again, maybe for some folks that aren't uh, as familiar with the, the magnet side of the business or the rare earth side of the business, you know, there's always talk of substitution yeah. and things like that, especially I believe Tesla had actually mentioned yes. not in the not too distant past that they were going to be building magnets that did not use any rare earth uh, elements. So maybe number one, I'd love you, for you to address the substitution issue, whether or not you think it has any credence, but even before that, why is it that rare earth permanent magnets are so vital? I believe one of the previous speakers earlier today said, you know, it's great to build batteries and EVs, but Without those magnets, you still have a major problem. So yes. maybe talk a little bit about why the magnets are so important, uh, and then secondarily, your thoughts on yeah. substitution. So yeah, and um, let me just start, for those who don't know, um, when we think about battery materials, there's obviously, there are a lot of chemistries, mm -hmm. and it's still in flux as to kind of what the ultimate solutions will be. The energy goes from your battery to a motor of some kind. So the rare earth magnet is not in the battery per se, it's, it's in the motor where, the, where it's receiving the energy, that's how the motor mm -hmm. moves. And so we were, we were certainly when Tesla says and does anything, there's lots of headlines, we were surprised at the scale of the headlines with respect to that because actually the original Roadster, I think the Chevy Volt, there's been a long history of attempts of not utilizing rare earth magnets um, in EVs or in sure. use cases. The reason rare earth magnets have a greater than 90% share is because when you're thinking about a rare earth magnet versus a non-rare earth magnet, which can certainly be done, you, there are magnets that use them and there are magnets that don't, is that the size, efficiency, and effectiveness of the magnet, its ability to withstand certain temperatures and remain magnetized, there are a number of considerations that make a rare earth magnet much more effective. And in many cases, for example, in, you know, in some uses, cases where you certainly can't substitute it, um, but when it comes to an EV, when you think about the, the significant percentage in size and in cost of battery materials, prices for rare earths really need to be many multiples of here uh, for it to make economic sense. Now, I think with respect to Tesla, you know, they've kind of come out and said that they're going to produce 20 million units by 2030, going up from around 2 million. And when you do the math, and I think certainly we see this across the material space, the numbers don't foot, right? They're, they're not so... By default, they don't have the numbers for the rare. So they, they, to do a low-cost car, I think the, the implication is, well, you know, don't ask us about that now. We can solve that problem. Um, but all the existing platforms would, will still continue to use them. And in fact, I think if you look out three or five years as those grow, and certainly the rest of the industry grows, the demand is, the, the growth is just extraordinary. And I'll, I'll add just one more fun thing um, for people to think about, because we, we need to think about this as a country. But... There's currently a frenzy in the capital markets over AI right now, right? There's, you can kind of see it in some of the chip stocks and in the Nvidia, big tech. Sure. Yes. As we get through this first wave, if you believe in AI's long-term implications, um, as we get through this first wave, there's going to need to be use cases. My, my personal belief is that two key use cases are going to be healthcare and robotics, humanoid robotics. And you know, if you think about an EV, um, an EV is really just a robot on wheels, right? A robot is a robot with legs. An EV has a big battery and little magnets. A humanoid robot and any kind of robotics that are going to come out of this AI revolution are typically going to have small batteries and lots of magnets because those are the actuators. And so anyway, I do not lose any sleep at night over the, the scale of demand that is kind of coming over the next decade in our space. Would, I would agree. And so you know, there were a couple of things that I want to follow up on. You talked about pricing. I'd love, I'd love to get to that in a moment. But before we do, obviously one of the um, accelerants, if you will, of the electrification theme here in the U.S. is the Inflation Reduction Act. This is a 730-page document that covers a lot of the economy. Uh, batteries, obviously, is what we're focused on today, but there's not much in there about magnets, if yeah. anything at all. Why yeah. do you think that is? And maybe further to that, talk a little bit about you know, the MP strategy in terms of dealing with the government and, and interfacing sure. and things like that. Well, you know, I think, frankly, for us as a country, it was a miss. Um, now, certainly the rare earth, the critical materials sector, and rare earths in particular, will benefit from 45X, which is yeah. a significant tax credit. And so neodymium, praseodymium, you know, and, and the others that are key materials that were mentioned and understood. But 
I still don't think that there is widespread education on the importance of the full supply chain. It's not just enough to have the critical materials. Mm -hmm. You can have all the materials in the world. We will still be sending them to China to be made into magnets for our industry. Um, now, admittedly, the magnetics industry, you know, it's in the tens of billions. Let's say it's a 30 to $40 billion downstream industry in aggregate today versus what will be the trillions in batteries. There's just more focus. I mean, we're drinking from a fire hose as a, <laughs> as a society, but I, I do think it was a miss, and I think we'll have, to, um, we'll have to see more on that front because we have a lot more to do. Sure, sure. And uh, again, continuing with that, I mentioned earlier pricing. That was something you had alluded yep. to. Uh, I think in your most recent earnings call, you talked about China producers either being at or maybe just below the cost of production or break even. Um, give us your thoughts maybe more broadly on the state of the market and mm -hmm. how MP competes given a lot of the pricing volatility that we're sure. seeing in the market. Sure. So yeah, uh, the price of NDPR, neodymium praseodymium, which is the key rare earth input into magnetics, uh, that is our 90 plus percent revenue driven product, um, the, that price has come down almost 60 percent versus last year. Um, and so you know, that obviously is, is quite a bit of volatility. We believe, and you know, China's very difficult because the data is difficult. There's lots of affiliates and shifting, and they can really kind of show what they want to show. But between sort of looking at some of the documents and, and you know, our reading of the tea leaves, we believe that Chinese industry is actually losing money at these prices, um, which I think is bullish for, incentive, you know, for sort of where prices should be headed. That said, and I think, I think if we, we can sort of zoom out from rare earths and contextualize it with a lot of the issues that mm -hmm. we're facing. Um, the Chinese, as they see other parties going downstream and potentially taking industry out of China, they can certainly provide carrot and sticks across the supply chain in, in whichever way that they want. And so certainly one could argue that that's, you know, as MP is moving downstream and is refining and showing that we're going to be making magnets in short order, that there's, there is some ex external benefit to showing that that's not a very high return on capital process to do that. I think we've seen that in other areas. And I, and I actually would, I know there's a lot of OEMs and, and, and sort of government stakeholders in, in this room. There was a, um, a Bloomberg Business Week cover story just this week about the rise of BYD mm -hmm. and BYD now being the largest producer in the world. And there's, um, uh, it, it, when it comes to electric vehicles, and, and when we think about the top 10 EV makers in the world, four of them are Chinese. And the Chinese EV makers are outselling the Europeans in Europe. Um, and what that means, though, is that the, what's really at stake here are the downstream GDP and jobs. That's what they're after. And so to the extent that the upstream of the supply chain, which is vertically integrated for Chinese industry, can be utilized for carrot and sticks, that can significantly disadvantage OEMs. And so I do think, and I've, I've said this, and it may be a little controversial, but I think that we're going to see you know, a household name. You know, it's kind of like if you think of 2007 and we were headed to the financial crisis, there were people who saw it. I think that we're going to see a household name in the US, in Europe, that will um, you know, fail or need a bailout due to the rise of Chinese OEMs and just frankly, that some of their companies taking the place of some of ours. Um, I, I guess I would finish that to not be too depressing and say that there are success stories. I think, sure. I think for example, and you know, GM has shown that they're willing to invest, and I think you know, they've made a lot of deals. So there are people in the supply chain that, that, are, that are kind of forward thinking in doing this, but it's just not enough yet. Understood. And so, again, can, you mentioned growth and GDP and sort of thinking, thinking um, about how to do all of this. But one of the questions or one of the issues that came up this morning uh, across different segments was um, one of the risks in really growing these supply chains is access to adequate technical talent. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've seen these statistics of, you know, the number of engineers that graduate here in the United States versus the number of uh, engineers in China and who knows what it is, 100 to 1, something like that. My question to you is, I mean, how do you, do you see that as a risk yeah. to the growth of your business? Adequate, or access, I should say, to adequate domestic yeah. technical talent? And, and if so, or if not, um, you know, how do you move forward? Yeah. Well, I think we, we told all our Gen Zers, go into mining. But I think we were saying critical, critical, and they must have heard crypto, crypto. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't. So, you know, we, I think we have too many people who went into crypto mining, and obviously now that that's reversing, we'll, we'll hopefully um, see some more. But it is a real challenge. I think at MP, what we found, I'm a big believer that, um, you know, talent begets talent, scale begets scale. Mm -hmm. um, when you 
build on a track record and show that you can be successful. You know, smart people want to work with smart people. Um, and so when I think about our magnetics business in, in Fort Worth, we're building a, you know, a pretty extensive research facility right attached to our factory. Um, we've had an enormous amount of, of talent, you know, resumes, people coming, trying to join our team. And so I, I think that there's going to be some winners and losers there. I definitely think that you know, this is an industry that has not historically attracted a lot of talent vis-a-vis -vis some other areas. Um, and so I guess in some respect, that will always be a knife fight. But I don't worry about that because the market will, you know, as you know, salary and compensation and opportunities go up, as capital is raised and success is shown, the talent will come. Sure. Um, so. And so you know, maybe as, as an additional sort of thought around the business model and how you're growing this business, I, I'd love to learn a little bit more about your diversification strategy. I mean, mm -hmm. you've got, I believe, metallization in Vietnam, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, agreements in Japan. Can you talk a little bit about, sure. I mean, for all of the talk and I think the, you know, the, the appropriate talk about building a business here, talk a little bit about how, how and why you know, you're thinking Vietnam and Japan and other parts of the world. Sure. Well, our goal, and we say this openly and proudly, is we want to be a global champion, right? We are an American company. America needs a champion in this space. Mm -hmm. um, at a minimum, it's an insurance policy for an industry that is nearly 100% dominated in China. Um, there are a handful of Japanese magnet makers. They, most of their supply chain is out of China, almost all of it, um, uh, and many of their operations are in China. But there, there are opportunities to do business with, with and supply the Japanese companies. So we certainly want to do that. Um, you know, Vietnam is is uh, an opportunity to. It, it's a low cost jurisdiction, uh, obviously non-China. It's a great vantage point to be able sure. to service um, you know the rest of that industry. And I do think, I mean. From what we've seen behind the scenes in the reach outs, and certainly as it goes, if you think about the rest of Southeast Asia, there's a lot of interest in this space. And so, you know, our perspective is we've, we've built a nice lead um, and scale, and we want to just continue to do whatever opportunistic things we can to, to broaden and diversify this supply chain. And, and so we'll keep doing that. Excellent. And, you know, as I sort of think about that, and, you know, you mentioned the, the deal with General Motors. I'm sure you're in, in, in talks with other OEMs and downstream players as well. I mean, how big do you want MP to ultimately get in terms of production? I mean, are we talking like the, a global behemoth or, to your point, just yeah. kind of going in the supply chain there? I mean, how big, given that, you know, you've got Mountain Pass and you've really optimized production there and you're building phase two and phase three, I mean, what is the ultimate vision that you have in terms of MP from a size well, perspective? You know, it's a great question. Um, you know, we're an owner-operator culture. Mm -hmm. I'm the largest shareholder of the company. And you know, the words, if you were running around our headquarters or the mine, the, the three words you would hear the most are execution, execution, execution. Um, and you know, obviously, that in this space has been a challenge mm -hmm. um, for many parties. And if we wanted to go out and you know, sign lots of deals and make pronouncements, I think certainly that opportunity is there. What I'm really focused on, I mean, let's, let's not, you know, let's not underestimate the scale of the challenge that we've taken on. Our right. biggest competitor is China. We're building a magnetics industry and supply chain from scratch. Um, and so we want to hit base hits. We want to not bite off more than we can chew. Sure. And we want to make sure that when we sign deals, our deal with GM is not exclusive. We expect to have other customers, uh, you know, in, in other verticals as well. Um, but we need to do a great job for them. Um, and so assuming, and we will do a great job for them, we will then do a great, continue to do a great job for other people. I do not want to go out, sign a bunch of deals, um, and make a bunch of commitments that we can't deliver on. That's frankly why I'm here. You know, there are parties that <laughs> got into trouble kind of doing it the opposite way. And yeah. I think that the best governor on that is when you have an owner-operator culture, um, you know, you care, you're really focused on the bottom line, and we need that. We're not going to have a successful commercial industry if you don't have companies that are saying, hey, these are my dollars. This is not just DOE money. This is not just grant money. This is not just, you know, whatever the case may be. And we need more of that, too. That's not to belittle that. But sure. we also need, you know, parties who are really feeling that, you know, that budget overrun. Oh, excellent. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one last question. And just kind of, again, keying off of this idea, this theme of growth, and you know, not necessarily how big you want to be, but um, what about R and D? In other words, mm -hmm. you're, you're talking to existing and future customers and how they might see the magnet business. But 
what is your view on research and development and how you're growing that? And secondly, what about recycling? What about yeah. magnet recycling? Is that something you've thought about? It's a great question. Well, certainly we're ma we've making the commitment um, for R and D in a in a very extensive way because sure. we're building. You know, as I mentioned earlier, we're building a a big research lab connected to our factory in Fort Worth. Um, and so, you know, we, we expect to do a lot of great, when we already are, we have a team that's assembled down there and we're doing a lot of great work on that front. So we expect to lead in that and we expect to generate a lot of IP in our space. And so that is a, you know, really important. And then um, along with that, uh, which is a really important point is recycling, um, we believe we'll be the leader in that. In, in rare earths in particular, if you think about magnetics and kind of getting the materials separate, it's really solvent extraction. Right. That is how you recycle. Uh, and so that's what we do at Mountain Pass. And so typically when you make a magnet, about 20 or 30% of the material uh, is swarf or is cut off mm -hmm. in the manufacturing process. So to, to be vertically integrated is an enormous advantage. And in fact, even Chinese industry is not vertically integrated. There are different parties. And so our ability to take waste from our factory line and figure out where in our process flow to put it back in should allow us to, to cut a lot of costs out of the system and, and, and be a leader on that front. And we certainly have um, you know, studies, pilots going on with sure. you know, names you would know on that front. The last thing I would say is we can't run away with it. And I, I say this sort of zooming out, not just rare earths, but critical materials and aggregate. It sounds great. Recycling is important. We need to do it. But we can't run away with it on that front because if you think about the life of an EV and you think about what penetration was 10 years ago, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be a good five to 10 years before there's enough scale of stuff to really make it sort of a viable enterprise. So the idea that enormous investments in recycling can kind of eliminate mining or the need for new production, it's just not realistic. Right. Probably ever, but but at least not for the next couple decades. And so, um, you know, we're, again, we'll lead on that front. Um, but it's from an economic standpoint, unless you're vertically integrated, um, I don't think it's a standalone business yet. Excellent. All right. Well, we are we are over time. Actually, I'm sure yeah. we could go on for much longer. But uh, thank you thank for your you. time thanks for and me, thanks Chris. for the opportunity. Yeah. Enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Bet. Thanks,